Dear friends, we greet you in the Lord Jesus. And this is the first in a series of 12 times together having to do with God's purpose for the believer. It's very important to know his will and purpose for one's life. It's important, matter of fact, to know the purpose for anything. But it is especially vital for the Christian to know God's will and purpose for his life. And until a Christian knows this, for sure, he is badly handicapped and um, pretty much static until this wonderful revelation of God's purpose for his everyday life. There was a uh, cartoon in a recent Christian magazine where this college student said that she never had a purpose in life and then she came to college and got in with a way out group and now she has a purpose purposelessness and that's just the opposite of what things how things should be in one's life and especially the believer and there are many Christians today who are earnestly seeking to find out what God's purpose is for them, what God's will is for their lives. And there are many, of course, who are not yet interested, not yet concerned, not yet burdened as to what God would have them be and do. But for those who are yearning to know, hungry to know God's will for their lives. We can uh, share some things here together from the Word, which will enable each of us to know for sure, on the basis of the Word, uh, God's exact purpose for each one of our lives. And it's very plain in the Word because it's so very important. And yet, so very few Christians seem to be aware and to be sure of God's purpose for them. So if we can turn to Genesis 126, we'll take a look here at the Word, way at the beginning, very first chapter, and that's where God first reveals His purpose for us in the very first chapter of the Bible. And if we look at Romans at uh, Genesis 1:26, we can see here that this is the very first instance in this 26th verse, the very first time that God mentions man, and in His initial mention of man, in a recorded mention of man in the Word, He reveals His purpose for man, where He says, "Let us make man in our image," and this is God's purpose for the believer, that uh, the believer be conformed to the image of God, that the believer be like God. And it is not, in this instance, a physical image, because God does not have a body, God does not need a body, God is spirit. And this has to do far as we're concerned with the man who is living inside the body and it is actually a moral image it has to do with reason and intellect and emotions and the will that image the man the characteristics of the man the life And God would uh, conform man in this image so that he could have communion with man and man could commune with him and that they could have fellowship one with the other and that there could be uh, cooperation between them so that uh, God could love man and that man could return that love. Fellowship. And when we think of uh, 
this relationship. We must remember that God is God, that He is sovereign, and that we are subjects to Him and His sovereignty, that He is the Creator and we are the created. And we mustn't be at all concerned about this relationship that we might think right away, well, this sounds like slavery because it's nothing like that at all. A subjection to God and His will is freedom. Subjection to God's perfect will is perfect freedom. I remember talking with a man years ago, unsaved man, and I was sharing with him a few thoughts about belonging to the Lord Jesus and how wonderful it was to have Him as one's Savior and Lord and life and for Him to motivate one and lead one and live within one's heart that one could have the privilege of being in subjection to Him. Well, he said, even if uh, there were a God, I wouldn't be interested in anything like that. I want to be free. I want to live my own life. I want to do as I want to do. And it was very sad to hear that because being in subjection to one's own life, being in subjection to self, is abject slavery. Being in subjection to self is the worst type of slavery. And the pitiful part of this instance was that the man had no idea whatsoever that he was a slave to himself. The old fallen nature, actually a slave to death. So the wonderful thing about our relationship to God is that as we look to Him and submit to Him, there is freedom in our lives. Freedom for development, freedom for fellowship with Him, cooperation with Him. And we know that God uh, did create Adam in His image. And it's interesting to realize that Adam is a um, federal head of the human race. He is the representative man. And what God would do in Adam, he would do through Adam in the entire human race. So that as he created Adam in his image, his purpose was to have the human race spring from Adam, who was in his image, and therefore the human race would be in the image of God, and God would be able to have communion and fellowship and uh, with the entire human race. There would be a relationship there of love and uh, of life. There would be cooperation. And that was God's uh, plan. But we know what happened very soon. In, uh, God was uh, testing the federal head of the race. He wanted to bring him from innocence to a state of responsibility. And he told Adam that uh, he was free to partake of all the fruits of the trees in the garden with the exception of the one tree. And he warned him and told him that in the day that thou shalt eat of the fruit of that tree thou shalt surely die. And we remember how Adam chose to go his own way rather than God's way. And he was uh, tricked into it by the enemy. And he did partake of the fruit of the tree that God told him not to. And at that very moment, he died. He didn't die physically, but he died spiritually. He died unto God. And God is the source of all life, so that he lost his spiritual life. He was dead in trespasses and sins. 
and all who have since sprung from Adam have been born into this world and born in the human race as those that are dead in trespasses and sins. They're dead to God. They're alive to this world. They're alive to the enemy. They're alive to themselves, but they're dead to God. And one would think uh, that possibly God's plan and purpose for each one of us was thereby ruined by the fall of Adam. But uh, praise the Lord, it was not ruined, and God did not uh, slow up at all, even in his purpose. Did not deviate, but continued on to work out his purpose for each one. But he did not continue that purpose in the person of Adam. And that has uh, a lot to do with the Christian's life today. Many Christians feel that uh, God is seeking to carry out his purpose and will through Adam, and uh, they are working to get the Adamic nature, the old nature within their hearts, to be better, to be Christian, to obey God, to live for God. But God is not working any longer through Adam first. He has turned from him, and he has continued to carry out his purpose in a new Adam. And if we turn to Hebrews 1.3, we can see very clearly how God is working this out and how he bypassed the first Adam and brought forth a new Adam, the last Adam. We see here in Hebrews 1.3 God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son who being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person and here is the Lord Jesus that God has placed him on the earth as a member of the human race through the Virgin Mary. And he is God's last Adam. He is the representative man. He's the federal head of a new race, a spiritual race. And God is now working through the last Adam, but not through the first Adam. And right here is where the new birth enters into the picture. Our first birth, our natural birth, we were born from Adam, the lost Adam, the fallen Adam, the Adam from whom God has turned. And when each of us as Christians came to realize that we were lost because of Adam, because of our nature and that uh, we finally re came to see that we could not uh, better ourselves we could not uh, be accepted of God in our natural state and we finally came to see that uh, the God had given us the Lord Jesus Christ as his acceptable one And we were to receive him as our personal Savior, as the one who paid the penalty of our sin. And we placed our weight, so to speak, upon him. We chose him. We turned to him. We turned from the first Adam to the last Adam. And we received him and took him as our own Savior. At that instant, we were born again. The Holy Spirit caused us to be born into Christ. We were taken out of Adam, the first, and we were placed in Adam, the last. He became our life. And in Romans 11:24, the word says, "Thou art cut. Thou art cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature." and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. And the Lord Jesus is God's good olive tree. And we were grafted by nature. We were grafted into him. We were, we 
became partakers of the divine nature in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Second Corinthians 5.17, the word says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And in God's side, in our position before God, he no longer sees us in the first Adam, but he sees us in the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam, the acceptable one. And we are now accepted in his beloved because of our new nature, because we are in him by nature. He is now our life. And God placed us in him. In First Corinthians one thirty, we see, But of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So we see also in 1 Corinthians, uh, as in Adam, the first Adam, all die. So in Christ shall all be made alive. And God took us out of the first Adam and he placed us in the last Adam. And that's now our position. And since the last Adam, since the Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person, and God has placed us in him, it's very clear to see how God is carrying out his purpose. Let us make man in our image, where the Lord Jesus is his image, and God has placed us in him. And as we grow in him, and as we develop in our Christian life, we become more and more like him. Therefore, we are daily being conformed to the image of Christ, and he's the image of God. So God is carrying out his original purpose. Let us make man in our image. And he's carrying it out through and in the Lord Jesus. Uh, many believers seem to feel that if they could only find out what God's plan for them is concerning service, then they would know God's purpose for them. If they could find out whether they were to be a pastor or a missionary or a doctor or a nurse or a teacher or whatever it might be, if they could find that out and be sure of it, then they would know his purpose for them. But it's important to see that service is not primary with God uh, concerning God's purpose. Service is secondary, important as it is. But there is something far more important than service, and that's life. And life, God's purpose has to do with life and with growth. And service uh, springs out of one's life. Service comes as a result of one's life. And that's the way it should be. If we can turn to John 15:4. There are some thoughts that will help us see and get the right relationship between life and service having to do with God's purpose. John 15, 4, this area concerning the branch and the vine. And it's also important to see that this area concerning the vine and the branch in the word does not have to do with service. This has to do with life. And that's important to see. Let's read John 15, 4, where the Lord Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And each of us, as Christians, we are a branch. And we have been grafted, we have been born into the Lord Jesus, who is the true vine. And his life, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, his life, the life of the branch, flows into, the life of the vine flows into the branch. And the branch has no other life than that of the vine. Christ who is our life 
And we are to learn to take our place in our attitude. We are to see that God has placed us in the Lord Jesus. And we are to uh, have the attitude of a branch. We are to uh, receive. We're not to uh, produce, but we are to partake. We are to receive from Him. That is a normal, natural Christian life. And the Lord Jesus says here to abide in me. Abide. And this subject of abiding is important. Many Christians seem to feel that there is an effort concerning abiding, that they have to, in some way or another, get into the Lord Jesus or get into the right position and then try to abide and hold themselves there. But that's not abiding in the scriptural sense. Abiding actually means that we are to simply rest and to stand and to stay where we are, where we've been placed by Him. And so as we see in the Word that uh, of God are ye in Christ Jesus and that we have been born into Him, that we were cut out of the wild olive tree and were grafted into the good olive tree, as we see that in the Word, we realize that's our position before God, that we're in Christ. And we are to simply have that attitude and say, well, Lord Jesus, I see now that I am in thee and I just stay there I just abide there I just rest there that's abiding abide in me and I in you and he mentions in that same verse that uh, the branch cannot bring forth fruit of itself cannot. And it takes us a long, long time to really find that out, to really see that we cannot of ourselves bring forth fruit. And then in John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And it's very vital to see what this fruit is that he's speaking of. And we must remember that this section of the word has to do with growth and not with service. So that the fruit that the Lord Jesus is speaking of is a result of growth. So often it is considered to be uh, service and the, the, the fruit is to be the result of service that we are to win souls to the Lord Jesus and that we are to present this fruit unto God. But in this instance, in this part of the word, it's not speaking of that. It's speaking of growth and fruit in one's life where it has to do with growth is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. So let's turn to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And see how this ties in with this section. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And, dear friend, who do you think of when you see this cluster of fruit. We think right away of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of our life. And this, these two verses reveal aspects of the life and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the Holy Spirit uh, is the one who brings the life of the Lord Jesus within our hearts, within our spirit. His ministry is to give us and show us the things of the Lord Jesus. And he brings the life of the risen Lord Jesus who is seated in glory at this moment. He brings that life, that risen life, into our spirit, into the very center of our life. And there he abides forever as the Spirit of Christ the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And these uh, aspects here, love, joy, peace, are characteristics of the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus uh, He's the one who loves and He's the one who gives joy and He's the one who gives peace. The love of Christ constraineth us and uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the Lord Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. So that as we abide in Him and as the Holy Spirit is free to carry out His ministry, these and other aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus will be uh, manifested in and through us as Christians, as branches. And this is not only important for our Christian growth, but it's very important to our service because others have a right to see the life of the Lord Jesus. They have a right to see Him in Christians so that they can uh, come to know something of what He's like before they make up their mind, for instance, to trust Him as their Savior. They have a right to know something about Him. And it's the Christian who is the one who has the Lord Jesus living within his spirit. And the Christian is a living manifestation of the Lord Jesus to one degree or another on this earth where the Lord Jesus can reveal himself through the believer to the lost. Where he can, so to speak, reach through our lives and touch others and draw them unto himself. That is ministry, but that ministry must come as a result of one's life. One has to be before he can do. And even the doing is God and is the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus. For it is God which worketh in us both the uh, will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God. And not only the lost have a right to see something of him in the life of the believer, but the but Christians, the saved, have a right also. The younger Christians about us may not be as yet hungry to grow, may not realize what they have in the Lord Jesus, may not know too much about him yet, and they're not really eager and yearning to mature yet. But as they see something of him in their Christian friends, those who are older in the Lord, there is a hunger created and a yearning to know him better, that I may know him. So that the Christian's ministry is dual, both to the unsaved and to the saved. And this ministry is a direct result of his growth, his everyday growth. So as the Christian puts first things first, as he gets to know what God's purpose is for him, that he grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus uh, is more and more fully manifest through his life, that he becomes more and more like the Lord Jesus as it is less of self and more of Christ, that is, as it is more definitely not I, but Christ. God's purpose is being worked out in that Christian's life. Let us make man in our image. And how important it is to uh, get in line, so to speak, with uh, what God is doing. Cooperation. God has one aim in view with every believer, and that is to make him like his son. And that when that becomes our aim, then we're on the right track. That we have the same burden and the same goal as God does. How frustrating it is when God is going one direction and we are going off at a tangent. Maybe... Uh, all taken up with service, for instance, seeking to work for God, do something for God. And yet uh, God is uh, 
working at something altogether different. Then there's frustration in the Christian's life, and God has to wait until that believer sees what God is working at so that the believer can uh, submit and that his attitude and uh, heart hungers and burdens uh, become the same as God's. That I come to do thy will, O God. That our will becomes his will. Then there is peace and then uh, there is progress. And there's another thought here that will help us in seeing how God carries out his purpose. And that has to do with these two atoms. We, we should share some more things on that subject. <clears throat> that the first atom was a representative man and that when he fell, the entire race fell in him. In Genesis 5, 2, Adam begat a son in his own likeness after his image. And you see, after Adam fell, after he died to God, he begat a son, but he did not beget a son in God's image, God's likeness, because he was fallen. And he begat a son in his own fallen, sinful likeness in image. And that, of course, is a picture of the entire human race today. Lost, undone, self-centered, selfish, at home in the world, not at home with the things of God at all, not able to understand or even be interested, actually, needing the new birth, needing to be born into the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam. And he's not, the Lord Jesus is not the second Adam. He's called the second man, but he's not called the second Adam because he's the last Adam. If he were called the second Adam, there might possibly have to be another. But no, he's the last. And there need be no other. He is God's last Adam. And he is the federal head of the new spiritual godly race. Those who are born again. So it's extremely important for us to get to know this last Adam better daily. We see here in John 17:3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal, that we get to know the Lord Jesus, who is our life. And it isn't. Uh, many become upset about uh, this subject of head knowledge. Well, the person only has just has head knowledge. doesn't have heart knowledge. Well, there are some truths to that thought, but actually, head knowledge is extremely important, and head knowledge should come first. That the Holy Spirit gives us truth from the Word, for instance, through our minds as we study, and as we depend upon Him. He uh, shares the Word through our mind. Head knowledge. We must know, we must be responsible and intelligent Christians, that I may know Him. And as we study and as we get to know the Word and the living Word, the Lord Jesus, through the written Word, by the faithful ministry of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit at the same time is taking us through things in our daily life. And He's actually working this head knowledge down into our heart, that it becomes a part of our daily life, a very part of us in our growth and development. So that the two go together, head knowledge and heart knowledge. One comes from study and the other comes from everyday experience where the Holy Spirit takes us through things. And the two must go together. Each are... they're combined. 
by the Holy Spirit. So it's important to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, God's last Adam. It's important not only to get to know Him, but it's important to get to know how God does things, how God carries things out in our development to be conformed to His image, to be made in His image, how God works His purpose out. And this we learn as we grow. And one of the first things to find out as to how God works out this purpose is to see how he worked it out with these two atoms. Uh, the first atom brought death to the entire human race. God works through an individual man, and this individual man, this representative man, died to God, and all who spring from him are dead to God. And death separates the entire human race from God. So a Redeemer was needed, one who would take care of this death and bring life to man. Because the race was ruined by a man, therefore man has to be redeemed by a man. God works judicially. God works, he, his, his work is perfect. And he doesn't cut corners or deviate. And since the race was ruined by a man, it had to be redeemed by a man. And where the first man failed, the first representative man, the first federal head of the race failed, the last uh, representative man had to succeed. And we know that the first man brought death through disobedience. You think of uh, Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, And if death came through disobedience of one man, life has to come through the obedience of one man. And we remember, we remember how the Lord Jesus said, I came, I come to do thy will, O God. And the Lord Jesus came to obey. And he did obey where the first Adam disobeyed. But there's a lot more to it than this. Because this man, this Redeemer, this last Adam, uh, he has to be a man who is accepted and trusted by both parties involved. He has to be accepted and trusted by God, and he has to be accepted and trusted by the lost sinner. Well, we know that he's accepted and trusted by the Father. How God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the attitude of the sinner must be, This is my beloved Savior, in whom I am well pleased. We have to come to that, where we see him and trust him, just as God trusts him. And then it goes further, that um, not only trusted and accepted by both parties involved, but he has to be a partaker of both natures. And of course, he is God, the Lord Jesus is God. He's God the Son. And he said, I and the Father are one. And he partook of our nature by being born of the Virgin Mary. He became a man. 
she entered the human race by being born of the virgin he did not partake of our sin but he partook of our nature so that he is able to as God the Son and as the Son of Man he is able to equally represent both God and man he represents both sides equally and then uh, it goes still further he has to satisfy every claim of God upon man and he has to satisfy every claim of man upon God well we know that God has many claims upon man but what claim could man ever have upon God well lost man does have a claim upon God because God has promised him life in the Lord Jesus Christ he has uh, set forth many promises in the word and God has uh, man has these uh, this claim upon man that uh, God has promised certain things if man would receive them and so man is to claim the Savior he is to claim the Lord Jesus Christ for one thing And of course, as we claim him as our Savior, we have entered into all that God has given. We note in Second Corinthians one twenty, for all the promises of God in Christ are yea, and in him amen. So as we get to know the Lord Jesus, we get to know all that God has for us. All the treasures of the Godhead are hidden in Him bodily. He is God's all and He is to be our all. So this last Adam must satisfy all the claims of God upon us and all of our claims upon God. And He does. He must be a God-man. He's not a man who became God, but he is God who became man. And still further, this last Adam must succeed under the same circumstances and limitations in which the first Adam failed. He must be tempted in the same way by the same person to do the same thing. And if we move into the realm of the wilderness in our thinking, where the Lord Jesus was tempted of Satan, we can get this picture very clearly of what was going on there. Because there we have the last Adam facing the enemy, the very same enemy who caused the first Adam to fail. And when Satan caused <clears throat> the first Adam to fall, Satan won the entire human race by right of conquest. He influenced and won over God's first man. It won him over to his side. And Satan is the god of this world. And he's blinded the minds of all those in this world, of this world. And they all belong to him. And unless they are won over to the Lord Jesus, they will all spend eternity sharing Satan's fate. And here in the wilderness, Satan is seeking to win over God's last Adam. Not, not God's second Adam, but God's last Adam. And the Lord Jesus uh, simply must win here, because if he had lost, then God's purpose would have 
been finished because he would have had no other representative man through whom to work and carry out his purpose. And God sent his very own son to carry out this victory. And Satan was seeking to get this representative man, this last Adam, to disobey God, to act on his own outside of the explicit will of God for him at that time. We remember how the Lord Jesus was had been fasting for 40 days and night, and he was in hunger, and Satan took advantage of this and uh, suggested to him that he make the rocks into bread and to eat. And the Lord Jesus could have done it. But he did not do it because it was not God's will for him to do that specific thing at that specific time. He would not step out of God's will for him so that he did not succumb to Satan's temptations. And he won the battle. And he was doing it for you and for me in the wilderness. He was doing it as our representative man. He was doing it as our Savior, as our Adam, as our life. And he lived that perfect life so that he could go to the cross, a perfect Savior, and pay and atone for our sin. So that's God's purpose, all wrapped up and bound up in the Lord Jesus. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We were born in Adam, Adamic, earthy, lost. We were born again into the Lord Jesus, and we are to be conformed to his image. Our Father, we pray that each of us might be in hunger to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus, that we might grow in him, that he might express his life in and through us more and more fully. We trust thee for this in his precious name. Amen.